All right, so what I like to do is, if you haven't noticed, which I discovered in one of my other classes today when somebody said, what's the blog at week six? And I'm like, really? You don't know what our class blog is, right? Uh, not for this class, but it's for another class. Um, and then also that student proceeded with, we have a sketchbook too today? I said, yeah, and he goes, well, I haven't gotten one yet. I'm like, okay, well, uh, I don't know what to tell you. Huh? Yeah, did you get an F? No, I mean, he can can still pull it together. But it, it, if you look up on the blog, what I did is, um, this is what I want to talk about, what not to do, right? And some of you might not have had me before and heard me talk about things in perspective. So I think it's good to go over this. And I like to share a couple little pointers of things that I learned in the industry when it comes to drawing. And then most importantly, what I'm going to talk about right now is all this, okay? So I put up all this beautiful reference for you guys. I found some really great stuff on medieval England sort of time periods. And again, someone was asking me, like, why do we have to do medieval? And I'm like, you know what? It's one of those all around great time periods that's always sort of reminiscent. It's always being used. In fact, that one student I had, whose name is Pat uh, Markernet, Pat had told me, he goes, yeah, that the stuff we did at CGMA inside with the medieval stuff is what got him his job working on Sophia first, so, uh, Sophia the first at Disney. TV. And that was like a huge part that got him in because he already had a lot of these environments. So we were just talking one day, you know, uh, we were chatting and he's like, yeah, there's so much character in there. And there is. That's the great thing about these buildings and structures. So what I wanted to do, and I thought I would sort of try to convey to you guys, how does fill work and how do I set up a drawing or a particular rough or design? And one of the things that I do is this, is I take a little post-it, I gather my reference, and I start looking at my reference, and every time I look at a new image, I write something down that reflects part of that image, and then I have all my notes on one little pad, and I go back and I incorporate those notes from that pad back into my drawing, okay? So when I was looking at this, man, this immediately just, I don't know what you guys thought, but this is just simple, easy, two-point at its finest. It's a great building silhouette. So one of the things that hits me, and I'd like you guys to chime in too, what do you notice about levels on this? How many levels, how many stories are there? Yeah, there's like four or five. It's actually sort of hard to count, which is sort of cool. It's a way of sort of confusing the viewer and making it look a little bit more busier than it is. But if you look at it, we have a lower level with stairs. We have this other level with these little terraces that come out. And then we have a third and we have a fourth up there. So it doesn't look as high, but I think having you know that four story and four levels adds a lot to it. The other thing to me that really hit me that I like are these little terraces that pop out. The two side terraces that come out of there. I thought those were fantastic. The other thing I like is how, notice how they grabbed the bottom and they raised it above the ground by adding stairs. That's a great idea because back in part of this time period, whenever it did rain a lot in a country, they tend to elevate structures with rock and foundation above, so you would go upstairs. That way, any of the, because one other problem is, is a lot of people in this time period would defecate and urinate on the dirt of areas, and whenever it would rain, it would all come back down into town and you get disease. So by raising it up a little bit, it's out of part of that structure, and that's you know something I noticed in gathering a lot of reference, okay? Um, when I looked at some of these, you know, they were, they were pretty cool. Again, I really liked, one thing that popped in my mind, this artist has a lot of these black and white sketches. I don't know who he, AR, or who he is exactly, but I really like these little curved supports. So that's one of the things I wrote down on my, you know, my little cheat sheet right here. Okay, there's little curved supports all over the, that are supporting part of the, um, the structures. And then because of that, it's popping out. The other thing I noticed is, this was sort of interesting how he's got this big double door here that looks like it could be a barn, but then he also has a separate, et, a separate entry door over on the other side, okay? Same thing here, another variation. Again, I'm starting to see these common themes. One, two, three, four stories tall, right? What I really liked about this one were the little cornice windows, these little um, small windows that extrude off of the rooftop, okay? Uh, I also liked some of the detail that he put in there. You know how he went from like, there's like a brick down here, then it gets brick and it goes into wood. And then up here it looks like wood and plaster. Then there's brick up here and then you have the tile. I thought that was nicely done. He also put these cool little signs. So I'm gonna put signage on there. 
on my little cheat sheet. All right, go to another one. This one another, was another favorite that I saw, and I was like, wow, what's really cool about that? Uh, I don't know about, what do you guys see in there? What's something that's really neat? The tower thing that grabs. Yeah, the tower does. You know what's so cool about the tower? Is it almost splits it in the middle, yeah. but then you have two different sides to it, which makes it very appealing. You don't have equal sides. You have opposites there. Anything else? The mass of what? The beam coming out of there. Yeah, that's pretty cool. There's something else that caught my eye, which was, yeah, Paco? Uh, it's kind of like a triangle. Yes, the, yeah, the great call there. It's in the shape of a cool triangle. And not only that, look at in a composition element where we bring composition into design. Look at how there's a triangle there. There's a triangle there. There's another one there. The triangle is actually being uh, constantly repeated. Mike found it. He put it in my inbox. He said, my, my drive. Anyway, so it's, it, that shape is constantly repeated inside there, and that adds to it. But here's the one thing that I noticed. All you guys are completely right. Look at how many roofs there are. It's like one, two, three, another one back here, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. There's like 12 different roofs in there. So when, when you could have one roof, he found a way to like, okay, I'm just going to drop you down and put another roof out, right? So I'm going to put that little note on here, 12 roofs. Not, I don't know if I'm going to get to 12, but it's something for me to consider when I'm working in my drawing, right? Um, this was one of Brenda's f favorite places. It was a, a tavern. That's, I'm just kidding, Brenda. Um, after the joke she made earlier um, <laughs> about drinking, right? Oh, no. Yeah. So what? when I looked at this... I wasn't really interested as much in the building shape, but look at the windows. The windows with those little crisscross things. So there's like bars in there separated with little crisscross. I thought that was pretty cool, those design elements. I also thought this was a neat touch, how there's just a beam hanging off with a light hanging above there. That could be a really basic, simple light. And I really like the look of that. And I feel that could contribute quite a bit. Now, this is cool. And I think I mentioned this in the notes to you guys. Okay, if you want to do a lot of work or have a really great piece, it could be for a portfolio, raise your horizon line very high. And this is a great example of that. When your horizon line goes up really high, it causes you to be looking down on top of everything. So you, this is really cool because a lot of times we're responsible for drawing and creating establishing shots. However, though, there's also what I call like more of, a, of, a, of an average view as if you're on a street and you're walking up to the exterior, and that's the view I'm gonna to draw today, where our horizon line is down low. In fact, most of these other images right here, our horizon line is down on the lower spectrum about right here. So there's a great feeling that comes from that. So as you work into two point, you have to be considerate that, hey, if I raise my horizon line up really high, it's going to really impact me looking down on things, which means it's a lot more work to get this in. Not that that's a bad thing, you could still get it in, but it can be secondary detail to your primary building. So you'll notice one of the things I put over here in the blog is I gave you a couple, um, I told you a couple things about what to do, and then I mentioned, where is it? Um, actually, I was gonna mention it. Actually, maybe I didn't mention it. I was gonna save it for this demo. So that what I was gonna mention in there, maybe I didn't publish it, was a great way to work on this project is to just design Keep your horizon line on the lower end and design one key large structure in two point. When that's done, come back and then design the buildings behind it and then design some elements in front of it and the drawing will start to come together on its own. What you don't want to do is dive in there and start doing foreground first or background. Just focus. This is a great little simple technique for working in two point that always works. The building that's the key area uh, or key focal point or focus of the image. Have that be the most interesting visual read. Everything else back behind it becomes secondary. Anything in the foreground is gonna be used for uh, indication of scale or supporting part of the story. For example, like an old cart or maybe an old lantern or maybe uh, it's in the time period where, where they had lots of newspapers for print or guys would sit in their little shacks and and sell goodies and cigarettes and tobacco and stuff like that. Those are the items that are going to help support you. Okay, back to this. So we'll come back to this. This is a great way to work. And you know what? This is one of the reasons why I was sort of thinking about postponing the, the tonal until the end because 
Sometimes you don't have to go in and do a finished tunnel study. A lot of times, all you have to do is what they're doing here, where you have some tone put in there and you dull it down, and then your primary focal point gets a little bit more light and a little bit more detail on it, and that becomes the visual read. That's a great little piece right there for a portfolio, okay? So let me move along here. I put a couple 3D models up because I like some of the wood trim that was in there. But then the only problem I had with this is some of the textures blend in and it gets a little hard to see. So that's one of those notes I make to myself telling, you know, hey, if I'm going to put a little dormer, or I think I said cornice last time, but a little dormer window that's up here on the roof, I want to make sure this little end corner raises above or, or goes above that top line to break it. Okay. Um, I saw this and what I liked about it was the stone and the wood. No reference. Now, this was a little bit of chaos in here. Does anyone know why? Too many vanishing points. That's right. You have this roof going to one point and another point over here. This is going over this way to a different point. And then this building is turned going into another set of points. So it makes it look like the architect that made this or designed it was a little intoxicated at the time and things are a little crooked all over the place. And even though... There's that debate that comes up and goes, well, technically that could really exist, Phil. And you're like, yes, that's true, but does it look right? Does it feel right? It doesn't really feel right, does it? Because you see these bending points everywhere, and when you look at it, you're like, nah, it's a little bit too much of a headache for me. So that was what I liked about this was I love these little rooftop shapes and everything, but what I didn't like was all this stuff down here. Okay. All right. So um, that one was pretty cool. To me, that was simple. It was easy. I noticed a couple of you on the last assignment, you guys went in and you didn't have quite enough building space for somebody to live in there. Meaning that you had maybe one or two stories and it was like a one room little studio flat. So looking at this, it's a little tight, but this reminds me of maybe a home for like one individual, right? This doesn't look like a home for a family. It's way too small, okay? Um, here's another great, by the way, part of this style that you're seeing here with the white and the gray on that. That is what has been taught quite a bit by Feng Zhu. And some of that comes out of some of this art center tradition. If you look back at like Doug Chang and a bunch of other designers that were just using simple grays against other dark grays with line, with white highlights to communicate uh, a visual read. That absolutely works. That is a beautiful portfolio piece right there, okay? That's a great model, okay? Um, on this, when I was looking at it, did you guys see any, what's interesting to you there? There's one particular thing that popped my, my, my eyes when I was looking at it. It deals with the roof. It's actually a couple things. One is, is see how they ended it early here? And then here, they made it longer and put a curve on it. And then on top of the curve, they put these little like angled dormers coming out of there too. So I'm like, that's a pretty clever design right there. So I'm writing that down if, on my roof if I have one uh, higher and then one lower than the other, right? That's a little attribute I can add into part of my design. I think that's pretty cool. The other thing that I thought was neat is I like that little curved um, passageway there. Like people can pass through like they're going into town or maybe this is where a blacksmith might live, right? It gives me some other ideas who might be, you know, living in this particular area. I um, thought this was pretty cool because this is a typical call-out sheet that you have to do. If you have an environment that's drawn, you usually have to go back and draw parts of it at front views, side views. And so if you notice here, it's left view, front view, right view, there's indication of scale. Then they've gone in and they've had to indicate, well, they have to paint it real quick and then they have to do texture callouts. That's something we could do in this class if you wanted to, because it is a really, really important part of both game design and animation design, because this is how people work in 3D, is that your goal outside of the drawing is to provide them with a detailed model pack on the environment. Now, this class doesn't really, we're not here to focus on color, but if you wanted to go in and do something like this, we can figure out some time. I think it's important because that right there, I have pages in my book that are like that. I had to do that stuff for Big Idea on a lot of our 3D productions, okay? It's valuable information to pass down. So you might be submitting work somewhere 
and maybe there's not a position for drawing or designing, but they might look at this and, oh, bring them in and let them do a bunch of our art direction packs and let them create a bunch of the notes that we need to give to our 3D artists, right? Okay. Talked about this guy, very distinct styles. I actually looked at that one already. Um, again, I really like what he's doing with the roofs. Long roof, short roof, another roof. And I like these little supports up there. One thing that's really cool to do in an environment sketching, it happens a lot with interiors, is visual weight, where you draw something and make it look like it could tip over. It's really hard to do. The way we do it with interiors is when you have like a shelf and you have like a large book or a bag of flour and the bag of flour looks like it's hanging on the end of the shelf and it looks like it could sort of flip over. That creates a little bit of visual interest to the viewer. And what he's doing here by coming in and adding these beams in there, do you see that? And putting those little cross beams, that makes it feel like, oops, they made it and they have to support it. Feels like that could like possibly slip down or come off, okay? Um, and then, of course, I actually found some actual reference, actual photo reference from old English rooftops. And I thought this was just, you know, worth its weight in gold because look at, look at the rooftops. Look at how beat up and in, in, in that time period, they actually took really thin slices of stone and they would put them on as shingles. That's what they used to use because stone was free. And so a lot of the old stone styles are just all these little thin cut rocks that are squared out, just placed on top of each other. Um, and then you look over, I really like how that was like a wooden board here, and then there's a window that separates. This is more like a plaster or a concrete. Look at how there's this weird cut right in here, and then they literally went upward and added another little structure right there, you know? That sort of fascinating to me, like, man, it's like they built one roof and they're like, hey, Let's go upward. So they cut part of that roof and they build another section going upward. So just looking at that reference, I write that down about maybe after I have a roof, I'm going to put adding and then going upward. Because I might not be able to think of that right now in my design, but then later I look at my note on my checklist, which you see right here, and I have about 10 things written on there, right? And then I go back to my checklist and I cross one off and I go, hey, I didn't think about that. Let me find an empty part of roof cut a little square out of it, and boom, I'm going to go and extrude part of that shape upward and add something else to it, okay? All right, so the rest of this, I'll just sort of flick through. That one was really cool to me, too, because look at all the, what do you guys think about uh, the variation of roofs in there? See how cool that is? How they're all staggered up there? And then look at the street. How awesome is that, right? How it's up high and comes down low? That's still a two-point perspective drawing. All you would do is draw your buildings coming into the ground and then raise one side of the street coming down at an angle wrapping around. That would give you a really interesting composition with a nice sway in it, right? Do you feel that the sway where I come here and I go like this from here and I go right back around? That's a nice little piece. And the other great thing is that, look at that, Historic England Archive, which note to self, if you're looking for some really good reference, type that word in. Once I found that one image, I went and I looked back and I typed in just Historic England Archive and I started finding all these really cool... I mean, doesn't that look like you'd go into like a barber shop there and that old street looks like where Jack the Ripper might be or something. I mean, there's so much information in there and, and there's really a, a really great feel about it. Um, found this old church in England. I thought that was cool. That could be a secondary building behind or to the side. I thought this was actually, I think was part of Italy, but it was really similar in the building structure to what you would see in a lot of medieval England. Okay, that was pretty cool. Uh, I like that chimney that was there, it was different. Okay. And then of course, I found that, which was, that's uh, an illustration done. Actually, I had a class with this guy. His name is Ed Gertner. And um, Ed was layout supervisor for environments for Disney Feature back in the day. And um, this is just a great establishing shot of the Church of Notre Dame in France. But it's still worthy of looking at because look at how this just pops out. And then look at how there's all these other rooftops. And I like how some are similar, but then they change and go in different directions. You know, and they sort of keep your eye plugged into the piece. Okay? And then, of course, these were from Pixar. So this is some development work at... When they worked on Ratatouille. I like that 
the way that pulls you in. And I thought it'd be cool to show you guys how even though they're using pastels and they're using traditional techniques, the person that drew this still knows perspective, right? They still know that there is a horizon line there. They know that there are vanishing points there because look, if I come over here and if I put my ruler right here, I'm lining up on this line right there. That's going exactly to the, to the VP and then that's going exactly to the VP, which is right there. It's the same vanishing point. So that's intentional because they want you to look at what? That's right. They want you to identify. They don't want you to look at this and go, well, we don't know where we're at. We're in England. Nope, you're not in England. You're in France. They want you to look at the tower. And somebody probably requested that in the script. You know, two characters sitting on top, looking over, you know, at the Eiffel Tower, enjoying and talking about France. It's exactly what that is. Okay. All right. And I think that's about it. I saw that, which... That was cool, but I don't know. It doesn't really fit. You got to have the stream, and uh, those ellipses can be really hard for some of you guys to draw that are just getting into stuff. Um, and then I saw this, which is pretty cool. Look at that light post right there. See it? There's like one strand that supports it, and then there's a second and then a lower. I never thought of that. Having like multiple supports to hold up one light, I'm like, that's pretty cool. And then look at the chimneys, too. Uh, there's a couple different ones stacked all over each other, you know, the large window, the small window. I, you know, just thought that was a pretty informative little piece there. Okay, so there it is. There's 39 pieces of reference that I have. Okay, so, so far, I'm looking at my notes here, and this is what I have. Four stories, two terraces, okay. Um, uh oh, I can't read my writing. I wrote it so fast. <laughs> curvy, uh, curvy roofs. Uh, Cornices slash um, uh, elevated, what do you call it? Win window, window dormers that are popping out. Okay. Signage, multiple roofs, 12 plus, like that one drawing. Okay. One roof higher on one side, lower than the other. And then, uh, uh, and then I put on there a roof. Um, on my way, I can't read my writing again. I wrote it so fast because I'm lecturing. But I'll go back and I'll check a couple of these. So you see, I already have like nine or 10 good comments. And I have a couple other things in there. I didn't write down chimneys or the light poles at the very end. Okay, so I'm going to write all those things down. So then when I go to sketch, I'm not just going into my sketch empty minded, right? I have information down. I've gone through my reference. I know what's really important. Okay, what I was going to mention after you look at your reference is that if you are a newbie and you are completely terrified and having a hard time figuring out part of your perspective, take one of the images that you like like that, okay? Throw the horizon line in there, find the points, start to draw the building, and then before you go into any details, lose it, and then add to it, and then change the building and modify it. That's some, someone's probably going, well, that's cheating. Well, it's not cheating. To me, it's the way of using a stepping stone to get going on a drawing, and then you problem solve it and figure it later. You gotta remember something, the European masters and the American illustrators all studied from each other. They looked at each other's works, they copied each other's work, they looked at how somebody else did a design because that would influence their design process. And if you really think about it, even myself as an artist to this day, that's the first one of the first things I do is I gather reference, I look at other people's work and I try to figure out what they were problem solving so then I could think of something that they didn't think about, right? Right, and then I incorporate that. So what I did is I went over here and I put that image up. I thought that one was pretty cool, and I thought that one was pretty cool. All done in two-point perspective. So not that I want you to trace the whole thing, but you can at least come in here. I can look at this image right here. I can put a layer on the top, and I could come in here and go, hmm, where exactly is my horizon line? I know right about there actually let me do that in blue i know right about there is my horizon line okay because i can't see um if i look down i'm seeing an angle which means i'm looking below that right it's below my horizon line and if i look upwards i can see up underneath these elements right so first things first you establish that horizon line next thing that we do after we get that line in there and it's established come over take a vanishing point and find exactly where those lines are going. Now, 
This sort of brings me to my next subject matter that I want to talk about really quick before I start drawing for you today. Okay? So what I want to do is I want to show you, oops, hold on, and go back and get rid of that line and take this image off. I want to show you a couple little quick cheats that I learned when I was working in the industry that deals with perspective. Okay? So you'll notice on the blog site, I put up, hold on, let me go back. So much for the memory working on my machine. It never works this semester. So you notice up here I put this little comment, don't do this. Okay? So let me explain what's happening here. In two point, per, and I, some of you guys already know this, but I just want to go over it again. When you bring your vanishing points too close and you make your subject matter very large, you get this image where you have one extremely large image and then it's, it's it, one, one area of subject matter that's really big and then you can't really fit anything else in. And one of the reasons you can't is because there's what we call a high transfer of scale. So if somebody's standing right here and they recede back this way, they quickly change scale because the vanishing points are super close, right? Right. So where a lot of you guys get frustrated when you go to draw is sometimes when we're working, okay, like this, you have limited paper size. So what I thought I'd do, some of you were drawing traditionally, with which there's nothing wrong with. So let me show you something that we used to do when we used to work in the industry before we had computers and digital stuff. And then I'll show you another little cheat, okay? That right there used to be a piece of paper, like 11 by 17. What we would do is we would tape on another piece of paper, it was 11 by 17 like this, okay? Then we would come over here and we would tape on another piece of 11 by 17 paper, it would be about right there, okay? We would then pick a couple of vanishing points like so, okay? Now, if I kept drawing with this long piece of paper, I'm always turning it and it becomes very cumbersome, right? So what we would do next is we would come into our piece, okay? And in the corner of our piece, we would put a line down right here in the corner, and that's called a measuring line, okay? So what I'm gonna do then is I'm gonna come over here I'm going to go to that vanishing point, and I'm going to do two different things. Number one is I'm going to lightly come in here, and I'm going to sketch some lines. Hold on a minute. Let me scale this down a little bit. Let me move it over a little bit more. And I'm going to sketch some lines coming off of that vanishing point, like this, inside my piece. Okay. Now, the other thing I'm going to do is you'll notice on that measuring line, let me do this in red so you can see it a little bit easier. I come over to my measuring line, and I'm, I'm working off my VP right now, and I'm putting little angle marks. These angle marks indicate the angle of the line. Does that make sense? As it's passing through. So when I'm going and I'm drawing, if I draw a line like that, I know I'm off because the correct line that would fit in there is going to fit between those two marks, and it's going to look like that. Does that make sense? Okay. So those measuring lines are really, really key for me. Okay, and then what I would do is I also come back here. So on the sky, sometimes I don't draw a sky plane, even though there could be one. But I just come back over and I go like this. And I put a bunch of lines going like this, going back to the same vanishing point. Okay, so that measuring line is key for me. Then what I do is I come back over to this side. I pick the same vanishing point, And I'm going to come over here very lightly in blue. Okay, and I'm going to do sort of the same thing. I'm going to put my little measuring line right there. I'm going to throw down a really rough grid that's very loose. It's just going back to my vanishing point. And, and someone asked me the last time I did this, they said, is there a rhyme or reason to where you draw the squares? I'm like, no, there's not. They don't have to be exact. The squares just allow me to see what is happening in what we call the transition of scale inside that scale plane from that particular uh, vanishing point, okay? So now I come back here, and it's really easy. I'm going to put a bunch of lines that are going back, and they're receding back to my key vanishing point. I'm going to put them here, here, like this, and like this, okay? And then I come back over here, and let's do the same thing. So some of you, I've noticed when you're working digitally, is that you don't think about this because 
you're working on an 11 by 17 image and you don't have that much room, okay? All right, hold on, I'm almost done. Bear with me, a couple more, oops. A little bit of slip right there. All right, there, and a couple more, there and there. Okay, now that I have that done, the next thing that I like to do, now that not only do I have a grid, but I also have measuring lines, is that I come in here and I take my handy dandy little marquee tool and I'm going to select this right here and I copy that and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn that layer off I'm going to add a new layer right here and I'm going to hit paste like that and then I'm going to scale this up so let me zoom out of my piece bring my piece down about here okay and it keeps scaling that up I'm going to move it to about right there and that's it and then I'm going to close that and then what I do is I lighten that down digitally like that and now I have an accurate perspective guide to draw off of. You see that? My vanishing points are really far off the page because I catch some of you guys on your Cintiqs, you're like, okay, I gotta stay in corner to corner. The problem is if you're staying corner to corner, you're gonna end up like our little buddy right here where you end up getting lines like this. See that? That line is a dedicated line going right down the middle of that composition, which is what always happens when you have your vanishing points too close and your subject matter too large. Now, what Phil's done here, and this is something I learned from working in the industry. I actually learned it from a guy named Nick Cuddy. It was one of my second jobs, and he would do this, is he would create these little grids, blow them up on a Xerox machine, and he would have like 10 or 15 of them available. And whenever we, had, we were in a rush to get drawings done, he would just grab one of these and slap them in. Now, we used to do this with drawing over with tracing paper as our guide, right? but it's the same thing working digitally. So now, now remember, I'm a step ahead of you guys. I'm going into a rough right now because I've already figured out what my design's gonna be in my head, right? You guys gathered reference and we're doing thumbnails, right? So as you move to a rough, or if you're in your thumbnail phase, you can still use this right here. You can make your own grid just like I did, copy and paste it, and here's the greatest thing, is that if I come over here with another layer, and I could already tell you what my composition is going to be. I could just draw a line like this and I could go, hey, that's going in the same direction as the other two lines. I'm going to have some type of cool multi-level structured house that's sitting like this in two-point perspective. That's going to be the center of my composition. When I'm done with that, I'm going to have a couple elements in the background here, a couple elements in the background here, and then I'll come in at the end and I'll add something in the foreground, something here and something here. That's going to be my composition right now. I've already planned out in, my, out in my head. So what I'm gonna do next is take a look at all my little notes right here, and then during class, as you guys are working, I'm gonna sit up here and keep sketching, and I'm gonna start building my little area, and as I build it, um, I'm gonna just let music play in the background, and then I'll go home and I'll voice over it, and then compress it down so it's not an hour and a half long in length, okay? But I wanna show you guys how to get to this starting point and how to work. So does anyone have any questions? And there's a huge value to this because you're learning how to start sketching with your perspective being correct right now. You have these given lines underneath and you can match them up. And this really, this applies to prop design, it applies to environments. It, it, it's almost on anything you want to do. If you wanted to, even when I go to sketch sometimes out in public and I see people walking around, I throw in a rise line, I sketch down a grid plane knowing how I'm looking at these people walking and what direction they're moving into, okay? All right, cool. Thanks, guys. All right, guys. Uh, sorry, I was going to... Um, I took a little break here. What I was going to do is I'm working on this other demo here right there. And um, I was recording that, and I decided to pause and come back because when I'm walking around my class looking at how my students are working, I'm getting very concerned because what my students are doing is they're working on an image like this, which is 11 by 17, and they are in here designing in the full size. And I'm like, no, why are they doing this? And so I noticed that a lot of you in environment sketching are doing that right now. That's a huge no-no, okay? Number one, a lot of people didn't finish their little studies, okay? Number two, I'm walking around and I've noticed that people are working too large and they're not thinking small. So part of our objective is to uh, think big but design small, meaning they do it in a small size that saves us a tremendous amount of time. Um, and so on that note, 
what I'm, what I'm going to do is split this demo. I'll show this later and voice over it as a part two. Then I'm going to go back in here right now and talk about doing some really little mini thumbnail studies. Okay. First off, the other thing that I noticed in my class that's giving me a little, little nuts is students aren't looking at reference. And I know you can't see my display here at home, but what I'm going to do is show you. I have a dual monitor set up. I have two different workstations. One's a Mac, one's a PC. Um, I prefer PC for Maya and modeling and also for drawing on a Cintiq and I prefer my Mac for digitally painting because and I just use a tablet because I don't like my hand blocking the screen okay so this is what you're gonna see on my dual setup right now one screen which is here screen A over here on the side is my sketchbook pro app and then over here screen B is my reference so what I want to do really quick is let me blow that up for you Oops. Let me delete this real quick. So when I come over here and turn on my, show you what my secondary screen, I actually have a high res television that's above my monitor. And so what I do is I just drag all my reference up to above. And that's how I sort of been trained to work because back in the day uh, when we didn't have monitors, I had an art desk and I would tape up when I was in studios, I would just tape up all my reference in front of me and look at it while I'm working. So I still do the same thing. And I just wanted to share that with you because as I'm drawing, this is what I'm looking at. So when I'm walking around the classroom and students don't have reference up, they don't have it printed out and then they're not designing anymore. They're not doing thumbnails. They're doing these big, massive, like 11 by 17 images. I'm just like, oh man, it's just, Everything that could possibly go wrong, that's a 10 car pileup right there. And you can't do that, you guys, you have to go back. So what I'm gonna do for the rest of this demo is come in here and I'm just gonna sit and sketch. I'll speed it up and voice over it, okay? But I'm just gonna have fun searching for building shapes in two point perspective, okay? That is really, really important to me. And for some reason, a lot of people bypass that in the environment sketching class. So I wanna come in here and get them back on track, okay? All right, with that said and done, let me uh, throw on some music and then I will voice over this. All right, cool. Here we are, we're back. And um, what I did is I sped up the video here um, to 250%. I know it sounds like a lot, but you know what? It's so much easier uh, for me to voice over like this because I gotta admit, um, when, I, when I'm, uh, working and listening to music I get into a rhythm and that rhythm works really well and um, and so when I'm talking especially when I'm in class and I'm having to look at people on their phone or goofing off or trying to get someone's attention having to talk loud um, it's easy for me to get distracted and not focus on my drawing so what I'm doing here is I'm starting with core basic shapes and um, you'll notice these lines I threw down here that's just habit from just years of drawing. I throw down these lines. They help me draw through the shape. They help me see shapes that I have. So I've looked at all my reference and I'm trying to really influence my students right here upon thinking and designing small. So I'm on a 11 by 17 paper and my goal is by the end of this demo to have four different variants of an idea for a building structure in two point perspective. Okay, so I've already lectured in class, and I'll mention that here again as review, talking about um, this time period, which is a medieval time period. You're talking about numerous buildings uh, that have, it's almost like they, not only did they build on top of each other, but when they wanted to push out a room or make an upstairs or make a dormer, what they did is they just sort of like cut a hole in the window and then push stuff out and resupported it. So. Um, there's this really nice sort of cool look when you look at um, old medieval time period and I know a lot of the, the reference I have has come from France or from um, uh, England but uh, man there's some other good stuff out there um, and it, it's hard to find but anyway um, that reference really guides me in part of this process and helps me so what I'm really trying to a building structure here multiple rooftops different extended um, bay, what, now they call it like a bay view window, you know, that pops out. And my goal here is to, you know, try to draw through the shape, um, get something that feels correct in perspective, come back on 
and you'll notice I even do this when, I, when I'm drawing in character design or anything else. Same principle in Maya. I start with basic shape, I come back on and I build my detail a little bit later. So I'm trying to really isolate and nail down what it is that I'm working on and how that's going to be communicated to the viewer. Okay, all right, so I'm just going to keep sketching away here. And, um, you know, I, I added up my time though, even though um, this is about a 40 minute uh, voiceover on this section here and I've sped this up about I think I'm at 200% speed up which is just double um, the they're about 30 minutes 35 minutes each so that means in terms of being in the class at a student level you should be sketching something similar similar to this in about I'd say 40 minutes to an hour but if you in the last class I ask students to come back in with some of these little silhouette studies and little rough thumbnails. To me, this is like a mixture of both, where it's a silhouette process and it's like a tight rough, the perspective's there. It's it's maybe about 10 or 20% off at maximum, but most of the perspective is pretty tight where I can go into it and I can adjust it. You know, I'm, So I'm thinking about the shape and the read as well as I'm getting into this piece, okay? so. Um, as I continue to draw here, everything's that basic structure, basic components, cube, extruding, which means pulling out, and then concaving coming in. It's just like, you know, back and forth in, in, um, in terms of shape and, and overlapping these shapes on top of each other to get better visual reads. Okay, so, um, and again, 30, it took me 33 minutes to do this first one here. And so, um, I'm, let me look at it on the timeline. On the timeline here, it's only about 15 minutes long. So yeah, that's about right, because I, I sped it up by 200%. So um, students, you need to become proficient and take the time um, to allocate your activity of drawing and spend an hour every study. And if you think about that, one class you're supposed to spend six hours of homework on per week, right? So if you spend one hour on one of these studies um, and you did four studies like I do in this demo here, um, that leaves you another two hours to start to block one in. So um, I have students that come to class and I could tell they didn't really do any work or they didn't follow it up. And the, you guys know who I'm talking to. You guys know who I'm talking about, right? That makes me want to track you down in the parking lot with a baseball bat. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I would never do that. But it does make me want to point out to you you have to allocate some more time into your work. And that's the only way to get better with drawing is to sit and sketch and be part of the whole program, you know, and get involved with it, you know. And sometimes you don't get drawings that you like, but um, like I mentioned a little bit before, as I'm sketching on these, I'm looking at my reference. I'm making visual notes. We talked about that in the beginning of this demo my visual note list and, and I can recite that to you. We talked about different angle roofs. We talked about um, overlapping shapes. We talked about dormers, we talked about different types of fireplaces, different types of windows, different types of doorways. Okay, All those elements are written down on my little post-it and I look at my post-it when I'm working. I make these little visual no notations. And the funny thing is, is I've learned to do that as well whenever I'm working in character design. Um, I, I have some stuff um, I've been working on. I'll show it to you. Probably I need to go back and render it and edit it a little bit. But I've been doing a bunch of mech design on mechs. And I'll go back into that and bring it forward. Probably in about another month, I'll release it up on YouTube. And, um, you know, it's the same thing. I write down what I'm going for, what's like the key shapes, some of the key emotions, finding all these key elements, and seeing how things come together. So, anyway, you guys really... Um, have to do that same thing with your reference and um, paying attention to you know what it is that you're doing in and especially in this time period I mean you're talking buildings that started with one core foundation they spread out uh, they had dormers they had um, lots of different windows tons of different windows and usually you had like a main door entrance and then you had a uh, a side window entrance it was a little bit larger some of the windows had those protective doors you know what I mean they're like wood coverings that had latches on them that would open up and so all those elements are really really uh, important and part of this drawing phrase uh, phase to incorporate so it keeps it looking realistic right anyway let me just keep sketching here 
and um, having fun. Nailed down. I really like that door there. Want to make sure when I'm looking at my reference, one thing I notice is all my doors need to be um, cobblestone, like big chunks of stone were put around them, um, especially in England and France. That's really, really popular. And so I want to make sure I have some of that in there. Uh, roofs, always, I'm going to say this word tile roofs, but actually I, I learned this. Uh, I didn't know this until I actually, I went back to Greece to visit family and I was walking through an old part of town, the city that my family's from. And um, I noticed up on the, on the rooftops that the, the shingles were actually made from like thin, um, not, well, it was like a thin tile, but it was like thin stone. It was actually like really thin sort of hard stone and they were just like you know you might see in in the United States or another country um, they're like composite tiles with holes drilled so you'd put this piece of stone down and put nails in it and then you would stack the other one on top of it and if you stacked them right water would not penetrate part of what you're working on so anyway th that was um, really cool to me so I'm thinking about that that reference point when I'm getting in here you know, after I do the doors, some of the other details, I'm going to get in here. I'm going to think about these shingles overlapping each other. And they also had a tendency to break their line, um, meaning that they didn't just lie on top of each other. Some would tilt over time with wind or rain, and then they would they would modify and be a little bit different. So right now what I'm doing is I'm coming in here and um, sketching in a little bit of a, of, a, of a handrail because I'm going to draw a cliff on the right-hand side. Uh, so I've already sort of thought that out because I like this look and feel of a, it, it, to me whenever I mentioned this before um, when you have something that looks like it's overlapping and falling behind something else it always looks very appealing so by drawing an edge here and making it look like the building goes off the other side uh, that adds a little bit more uh, charm and a little bit more interest into part of the sketch helps it develop a little bit more okay um, let me come over here and develop this side a little bit. This is cool. I mean, getting something, I'm just always I'm sketching on this. I'm trying to think, how do I pull something else from the back side? I'm, so in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about drawing through the shape and then another another room or a building that pulls off of this and comes away to create more overlap which creates more visual interest and more visual appeal again some small little windows um, and I decided to erase this part right here because uh, I want to put a, a doorway in there So maybe there's like one residence on the side, maybe that's in some, like a pub, and then you know maybe you know uh, the old woman that owns the building or the mom lives through this other door, or who knows maybe there's somebody in there making bread, right? I mean you're talking about you know when you look at this reference, really small areas built up on top of each other with all kinds of of different um, shapes that help it feel like it's in that time period. some curved tiles in here what I try to do is I don't do all of them I try to just do a couple on the ends a couple in the middle and then the eye sees the rest of it and sort of pieces it together but windows God small windows medium windows big windows curved windows I, I, I wanted to curve more of these because I noticed a lot of my buildings were uh, angular and so to offset the angles in there I want to make sure I'm curved topped windows I think that would be a little bit easier to read you know a little bit more interesting giving and then down here I'm just sort of you know imagining you know uh, big blocks of stone mixed with concrete and or mud that act as part of a foundation and a little bit more roof tile up here
uh, these little wood, they have wood siding. A lot of this too, um, that wood siding effect, you'll see it um, not just in, in English, but also in French and German. You'll see it in Dutch. Uh, I've seen it in Sweden before when I went there. So you're gonna see lots of these little, um, some of these old buildings, especially when I was in Denmark, I noticed it. Oh my God, uh, a ton of cities in Denmark, like down to like one story and two story structures. And they had tons of wood framing all around parts of the building. Uh, it's just a way of, it's just an accent, you know, that builders do. The funny thing is, is that even with a new contemporary house, we still do it to this day, um, you know, in, in the United States, they have like this, you know, a couple houses by me, some of the the more well-to-do people, they have this like foam stuff that wraps around. It's like a, a wood trim or some type of, but it's made out of foam, but it's it looks like wood. And so then they glue it up and then you, could, you can put plaster over it or whatever. And then it looks like it's cement. But again, it's just a form of an accent. So, you know, when it comes into penciling in little details and getting a structure to look right, you just have to ask yourself what kind of decoration goes on top of the cake. So what we did is we drew the cake and then we start thinking about, okay, you know, I have wood rails, you know, I got these these different various, you know, roofs. I have accent edges. Uh, I might have flags. I have thick windows, thin windows. I have dormers, you know, just how else do you detail up a shape? You just got to go through your little, your little Rolodex in your brain and try to, boom, plop something out on the paper and see what you come up with. And I hope this uh, guides some of my students to um, think about drawing and designing at a, again, what I always say to everybody, at a small size, think and draw small, but you're designing big, you know, if that makes sense. I'd probably overlap that and say it five different ways, knowing me. Um, but it's important because, you know, this sketch right here is 30 minutes, and it's enough for me to communicate an idea to an art director and you know part of my goal in doing this demo for you I'm looking at the total time this whole demo was let me see 32 minutes and 20 so it was I spent right yeah I spent about two hours on it and um, and now I've shortened it down to about 45 minutes to go over and um, you know it, it's important you know to have all those variants and, and just spend just think about it you know, what's two hours of time? It's really not a lot of time. And to come up with a whole page of, of different variations of buildings to show to an art director, oh my God, people are gonna love you for that, right? Absolutely, you know? One of the golden rules of, of designing and working for clients. And you know what's funny? It doesn't matter if you're, because I had a student make this negative comment to me recently, you know? That you draw a lot for animation. Okay, I don't just draw for animation. I've done work in design for games, and a lot of it's it's all the same thing. I mean, it, it it's just a difference of stylistic. You know, if you're if you're doing a bunch of drawings for an animation studio, there's going to be a style on a production. There's realistic productions, and then there's you know cartoony productions. So it all starts with the same core of drawing. When people make comments like that, what it really shows is your inability and lack of industry experience to understand the difference between drawing for animation and drawing for games. And um, I like games, but to be honest with you, I'll just tell you right now, one of the things I've noticed in people that I've worked with over the time, and I've worked with a lot of different people, is that um, game artists are very well-rounded and they tend to be really good at, at everything from painting and drawing. Um, but some students get this, this feeling or this attitude that like, oh, I just wanna produce big giant pieces of art and it's like, well, that's, when you start off in games, that's not what you're doing. Sorry to break the news to you, but usually in game design, you're going to start off, you know, that the art directors get those really big jobs, you know. So your ability is going to be, or what your, excuse me, your responsibility is going to be to draw and design props, draw them from multiple angles, and, and on certain occasions, come up and problem solve part of the design process. So that means come up with ideas for buildings, do multiple variations, work in small size. And again, it's all back to this. It's perspective, it's doing multiple versions, it's doing these, these fast little roughs, and it's, and it's coming up and problem solving with ideas for your art director. So that is a key element to that. So it, it sort of oinks me when I hear somebody go, 
you know, and make that comment about, well, this isn't for game design. It's all the same. It really is. I mean, I've done work for games. I've done work for animation. I've done work for consumer products, um, kids' backpacks. Uh, I've done children's book illustration. It's all the same. I never approach anything differently. It's all about good old-fashioned drawing, understanding perspective, figuring out your lines, starting with core shapes, and adding detail onto it. It doesn't change, you know? So... Not picking on any of you, but a couple of you out there know who what I'm talking about. When you make this comment, like, hey, what do you want to do for games? Then get that inside your brain and realize, like, hey, it's all about drawing, man. It, it doesn't, it just stays that way. It's all about the fundamentals of drawing and design. And that's what contributes to you being a good artist. And then, and then as you get out there and you start working and you make your work better and better, you'll start to realize that, um, wow, I can work in multiple fields. Um, I, I even forgot to mention theme park. I did a lot of theme park stuff because of my Maya background. I was asked to design uh, the entryways. Actually, I don't want to give away the establishing shots, the entryway to a line, the inside the line, part of the ride itself. There, and there are like numerous sequences that you follow, something like that. Anyway, so if you see those those lines down there, okay. See those like little cross lines I have everywhere? Those are part of my measure lines. Um, those are lines I look at that are indicating to me on what's happening and just I can quickly look at them and make sure I'm getting my lines in the right direction. So believe it or not, when I put those little chicken scratches down, they do act as a guide for me because they allow me to see shapes in the environment and they allow me to see what's happening and where a drawing is going. And that's what I really, really like. Um, but that's just me. That's how I like to sketch, you know. Every and here's the other thing too, you know. I I draw different than other people might draw. You know, I have, I I I tend to want to expand and create something new or different and see where it takes me. So I know people, nothing wrong with it, that want to work off reference and like pretty much become really close to copying a lot of the reference that they have. And you could do that. That's totally fine. You know, everybody draws in a different manner. Some people have to block out all the shapes. I like to start with a couple chicken scratches, build up my cubes, see where I'm at. And then there's something I call the flow. What's the flow? The flow is like feeling the drawing sort of come alive. And you know what's funny is that um, a student might not get that yet. Uh, um, some do. I mean, some really talented students that, that get into that flow. They know what I'm talking about. But um, when you talk to somebody who sketches a lot and spends a lot of time, then they know it. So you can see how I'm look. I'm going off the lines that I already sketched down in there. And those lines have already indicated, you know, an idea for the shape itself. And it's given me a better idea of how my flow is going to work in there, right? You know, I mean, it's, it, I have, I have a shape on the right. I got to complement it with a shape on the left. I got to make sure I don't have any tangencies. Got to make sure if I go large shape, I go small shape. Just everything's a balance. Keeps building on top of itself. Anyway, it's all about good old drawing mileage, folks, right? Draw, draw, draw. large window here right trying to keep also that gothic medieval um, the interior lining of windows tended to be heavy with like lead because the glass at this time would be you know was melted and poured and then it would fit into these little metal areas and they didn't have so what that means is windows tended to be very detailed um, because you needed that interior metal work to hold the glass together, right? Right. Boy, that would be a cool craft, though, um, or a trade. Um, man, I've, not, I, I've seen glass blowing, but I would love to take a class that dealt with, with uh, bending metal and then making a window frame and then pouring glass that goes inside to make like custom windows. I know there's like stained glass, but to me that's a little different, you know. So on this sketch here, as I'm drawing, I'm thinking about rocks on the left and and pushing out 
an overhang. So I like this idea of the cliff. This time I'm switching the cliff to the other side. Um, so I want to have a door here and then want to allow part of the structure to sort of sweep open to the side. Keep pulling this element off here. Oops, perspective was off there. Hey, I turned my Cintiq and you're drawing from one angle <laughs> and you're not looking, you're looking up real close. You're like, oops, went way to one side, you know? Large rock, small rock, large rock, medium rock, small rock, medium rock, small rock, small rock, large rock. That's what it is, Just little variance. Nature does that on its own, which is pretty cool. If you ever go out for a walk or go hiking, look around you and look at the little things that you might not, that you would normally walk right by and you wouldn't even care about. I think it's really cool to see those little details, you know, um, pebbles, how when like mud or something slides down a hill, there's a certain angle or a runoff of water. I think all those little things are really important. I think they add a lot to a piece. Um, and so the only way to become familiar with those things is to look around you and sort of pay attention to the things that you see. And um, it's funny, I, God, that'd be, wouldn't that be a cool video? I should take my cell phone out and next, we just had some rain here in California. Should talk about uh, the effects of weather on man-made, not man-made objects, but just what, what weather does and how it changes things. And, in, in the curves and angles of, of things and the way water runs off the way dirt builds up the way if something falls you know down and rocks roll down a hill it creates a sort of pattern of large and small I think all those things are really cool right there I just sketched I was thinking of like a little wooden sign attached to the door maybe with hours or something you know not hours but sometimes it might say pub or you know might have some message in Gaelic or Irish or something so I'm trying to get just a little wood door in here. A couple little wood cross beams. There's my door. Come back up, detail the other side a little bit. You know, the other thing too I want to mention while I'm sketching this is um, when I'm looking at this now, I know what the finished piece is. I've already finished it. And I feel like on that level, it was for me, it was probably like 80%, 80%, 85 I know I could have done better, but... Um, I'm just getting into the subject matter and it's for the class. If I was working for a client, I would have spent probably a full day just sketching. I would have spent at least eight hours of sketching and going through and figuring stuff out. That way I'd be a little bit more familiar. Um, I just decided to add a giant fireplace here. Don't ask, I'll explain in a minute. So um, the reason why that's important to me is that as I'm working on this, you have to have a level of confidence and a level of belief in yourself that, hey, I'm gonna pull this off and I'm gonna get it. So even though I have areas to the left and to the right that are unfinished, I know I'm gonna get there and I know I'm gonna finish them. I just gotta give myself time. So don't get frustrated. That's one thing I notice with, that some of my students do. They get frustrated and they give up. They're, oh, I did this and I left it. I'm like, well, why didn't you finish the drawing? Or, you know, what, you know be a little rough with it. And, Put some curved lines in there. Throw another roof line in there. Put something different. You know, finish it. Have fun with it. You know, don't, you know, look at it. It's just, you know, you have this structure that's working. You got to come in and pencil all these little details up on top of it. And that makes it sort of come alive, you know. I think everybody works like that. And unfortunately, in the land of YouTube, there are a lot of artists and a lot of people out there that are going to show you like one sketch and then they show you the finished and they skip and they don't show process and so I'm really big on that. I, I'm big um, as an artist and as a teacher where I want to try to display process to my students and show you that I am building up. I am starting from chicken scratches, horizon lines, cubes and I just keep building and building and I see where it takes me but you know don't get frustrated and don't don't abandon your work I mean it's so easy 
I, I don't know. I mean, God, that'd be a great topic to talk about because I'm sitting here and I'm sketching this and I'm like, yeah, I want to add another roof, move something to the side. There's little things I want to do to it. But at the same context, if you don't have that belief system in yourself, it's so easy to go, oh, I'm just going to abandon and leave my sketch. What happens? You have an unfinished sketch and you never spent the time to finish it up and see where it takes you. And to me, that's really a cool part of the process is adding all these little details and these little elements that finish the drawing and bring it to this really cool point, right? I mean, I don't know. For me, um, that's a, a really uh, imperative aspect to all forms of drawing. And you know what's funny is it as I, I was in a good drawing mood today because before I did this one, I went over to Starbucks and I was sketching alligators. So I sat down for about two and a half hours and just was looking at reference and started sketching. And it was it was hard at first because I spent like the past three, four weeks working on gorillas. And now I'm going into alligators. And I'm trying to change. Like I, I was, I had this original goal of changing every week, but I realized that's not going to happen. Um, I'm just too busy with teaching and everything else and being a dad, but I can change every three weeks. And I, I think I realized for me to really get into a topic and really understand it, it's really about three weeks of, of uh, excuse me, about two weeks of drawing to really get into it and really find my way and understand that particular shape language and how things are coming together and how it's, you know, being affected by perspective and composition and everything. So anyway, um, so same with this. I mean, I'm looking at it. I'm trying to, I'm noticing a couple mistakes. I'm not going to tell you guys, not now. I mean, I want to finish the piece. It's, it's, you know, retrospect is always 2020, you know, when you're looking back at something. So that's really easy to come back and create your own work and to be negative on it. But, um, I'm not, I'm just trying to think about, you'll, you'll see what I do after this. I have another little, um, Another thing I like to do with my drawings, and I'll, I'm actually going to show you the process on that, it deals with copying and pasting. I just want to flush out these windows here, and I want this overhang to feel realistic, and then I got to treat what's down underneath, and I got to treat the windows over on the left hand side as well. So um, this one went a little bit longer than I thought. This one's actually a little bit out of 30 minutes. This is in the 40 minute range, but it has more complex shapes in it. It has shapes coming out the side going upward it's one two three four it's about five story when i count the windows if you look at the bottom one go to the right two three go up four it's five stories so a five story structure numerous shapes tons of detail i'm going to go into the 40 minute range but you know what i come back to the same thing six hours a week you know and um you know i think that's the thing when i'm working on my stuff is that like most artists, I uh, you get lost in your work because you're when you're drawing and you're working, your brain is focusing 100% on the right right lobe of your brain, which is the creative lobe, and that means your left hand your left hemisphere of the brain, which is your uh, your intricate side, it's your time management side, it's your organizational skills. That part doesn't work. That's why artists, when they're sketching and drawing, tend to forget what time it is don't realize what's happening and what's going on so you know that's hey, that's a norm for me right there and not to mention too for me uh, another thing that I I battle with that's been a lifelong battle is uh, ADHD so there's some things I could really get into when I'm working on it and then it's also very easy for me to get distracted and because of my I have sort of like a high energy output you know so when I'm sketching I'm like boom I get into it I got to get it done I'm motivated right boom I got the energy rolling and then it's so easy to get distracted on something so it's it's taken you know uh, a good 20 years of my life to try to find out how to manage part of my ADHD and still to this day um, I still have a lot of hurdles and a lot of things to overcome so it's sort of one day at a time and trying to be aware of, of what you're doing to make sure you stay on topic um, this building I really like the idea of there being like huge supports underneath this so almost like they built it off this little cliff edge and it's like I just think that's cool when you have like giant pieces of wood hanging out everywhere and then I like the idea of there being like an extended so your eye goes from the ground it looks over here it sees the supports 
And then of course there's this patio. There's like a thin wood patio that's hanging off to the side. So that might add a little bit more to the piece and make it also visually interesting and appealing. Nope. And I realized maybe the weight of all that structure felt a little he heavy to me. So I decided to erase it and make it like a structure built to the ground. And then I'll add the patio in the back, if that makes sense. Um, to me, that's important because um, just as I started drawing into it in the back of my mind, it, it felt cool and sounded good. And it could work with those big giant, you know, beams underneath but you know what that's a lot of weight you have two to three buildings a giant chimney made out of stone so maybe it needs to be built on a solid structure and then the lighter stuff is built on anchored supports that comes downward right why not that would make sense to me and then maybe this is where they like you know they wash their blankets and they hang their blankets out to dry type of thing you know Just adds a little bit more detail. Gets the shape in there to work. Cool. I'm trying to bring this, I wanna bring the side of the road back to the front. That's important to me. I want you to establish and understand where the entrance to this place is. And then hopefully that makes you think about going to all these different levels and going upward and going around, you know? All right, paused for a minute. I don't know why, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I, was trying, I think I was trying to figure out what else to pull. Push and pull the shapes. Races a little bit. That was my fault. I had one overhang and then another one underneath it. So I need to clarify how that works. Then they have like a little flower plant. And then the, so that's the back side of the building. There's another little side that comes out with a little window, right? With a different rooftop. Just trying to add something else in. Clarify the shapes and the angles in there. Come down here. We need to put a put a, a couple windows. So let's go for a large window. And then if we go large, opposite of large, we gotta go small. Maybe it's split with some type of wood trim. Wood trim also comes off the side. Let's get back in here. So I like that structure quite a bit. So, you know. So I was telling you guys just a little bit before why I would spend eight hours on getting to know a subject matter, right? This is my second one, and it's already a whole lot better than my first one. I mean, don't get me wrong, I like the first one, I could still use it, but this one has more, it just has like more visual weight, there's a little bit more detail. I like the, the windows, I like the floor differences, um, the silhouette reads better. There's a lot more things in here that I think are, are working at a higher level. I like that quite a bit. Just thinking maybe up here there's another, they'd love to hang flags, right? You have all kinds of flags to hang. And, and, and not just flags too, signs, right? So in, you might have a decorative sign that might have a crest on it. You might have a sign that advertised pub. Um, also, you might have a particular flag out that marked your 
uh, you know, I know there were different color flags used for different things. Um, and then you also had people hanging out laundry and clothing and rugs, okay? So, now I jumped over to here. So what I'm doing down here, down below, so I wanna show you this. I am copying and pasting from the images I already did and I'm gonna overlap them, erase, draw something in the middle to create a whole new detailed piece, okay? Does that make sense? I hope that doesn't sound too complicated. This is something I've done before and uh, I accidentally uh, forgot to turn on the recorder right here so I skipped a minute and I came back. So what I'm doing is I'm overlapping my first drawing and I'm gonna put it behind my back drawing, okay? And gotta be honest with you, I actually learned this from working in Maya because working in Maya taught me a lot about reusing shapes and it taught me about um, so what I'm trying to do right now, I'll come back to the Maya thing. I'm trying to get this to fit together where I can see it and then I'm going to erase the line. So you're going to see what I'm going to do here. I'll zoom in. I'm going to drop it out a little bit. I'm going to erase some of the detail in here. Why? Because I have two different drawings that come together that they create a whole new design that I never would have thought was even possible. So there's a, there's a huge importance with understanding See, I'm erasing all the base there. I'm going to make a new base for it. And um, I'm going to keep the light, though. I love that light. I'm going to keep it right there. Even though it's a little too large compared to the other light, but that's all right. I can adjust that later. And this is a rough, right? Um, and let me get in here. I need to erase a little bit off the top, too. And then I want to get it to fit together. I need to make it look like this building on the right connects to the building on the left. So the building on the left was my first building, and now my right building combining them together most people would never be able to do that, right? But what I did is when I sketched my little drawings here, I made sure that they were on the same horizon line. And by doing that, I can lap, overlap the horizon line pretty close to each other. The perspective might be a teeny bit off, but that's easy. This is a rough. I could fix that up and tighten it. That My goal right now is not to do a perfect drawing. My goal is to create a couple ideas, show it to my art director, and show him that number one, I can I can take direction without asking a million questions. I can finish a drawing. I can think on my own. And most importantly, I can give my art director options and variations that help him see his vision for what the show is supposed to be. End of story. This is not about me. Don't even get me started. I have a couple students that take it all personally when you give them a crit. And they, you know, oh, you begged him, you told me this. I'm like, really? It's not about you. God, if you're if you're so thin-skinned, part of your responsibility is to create somebody else's vision. I mean, that's what film and that's what animation, that's what everything's about. There are people, usually with more experience than you, that are in a position above you and you're they're hiring you for you to bring your expertise and to guide them into their visionary process. That's it, that's what your job is. Your job isn't to come to work and be a pain in the ass and to take long lunches. Your job isn't to come to work and decide to do what you want to do because you think it's better. No one cares about your, you know, what your opinion is in that context unless they ask you. Your job is to produce the best designs you can, problem solve, and give them an excellent solution. So back to the Maya thing. The great thing about Maya was I would work on one show for one client and I might model 40 sets. I'd work on another show for somebody else, I'd model 20. And then I worked on a different show and I modeled like 50. So when I go back and look at that, you know, I, I would work on like a hundred and you know, 50 different, you know, locations in like a couple years. And so that means I have all these different parts. I had different dormers, I had different styles, so I could plug things together. So that taught me a valuable lesson. That's exactly what I'm doing here is I'm blending together my first drawing and my other drawing and now I'm drawing a couple of the things in the middle here that unite them together because so I want to make this structure feel like it is one large unique structure but composed of different little elements and in some weird way I want your eye to get locked into it where it doesn't leave because part of my compositional design in this is going into 80-20 so I'm thinking 80% building 20% environment and I really like what I have here I mean look at all those curves and, and buildings going from large to small, big windows, small windows, you know, opposite extrusions of bay windows, north facing bay windows, you know, what east facing bay windows. It's just it's just fun, you know, it's, uh, supported elements, non-supported. It's just cool to bring all that together. So now I'm going to bring the structure down 
And what I want to do is put some stilts underneath and uh, make it sort of come together, okay? Need to fix this here. Let me erase a little bit. So it's getting, to be honest, it's a little too detailed, but that's all right. It could come together later and I could simplify it, but I have something to work off of. That's all I care about. So I'm thinking some really big supports down maybe under part of this, this base here, like really thick supports. That's a lot of weight to hold up. Bring some rocks out here a little bit. That's cool. I like that. You can see how the road goes. The road's sloping downhill a little bit. Now, okay, there's something wrong in this. I'm gonna point it out. In perspective, I did something wrong. But I could fix it later. The, the light poles. The light pole on the left was copied and pasted. And um, it's much larger than the one on the right. Can you see the scale? So th that's a little important to me. It could be a little bit bigger and it could be a longer pole. Yeah, it could fit in there, but just the way my brain works, I'm looking at it and I'm looking at the what we call the transfer of scale and that scales off. It's a little too large there, but that's okay. The rest of the building and the rest of part of the design I'm really liking right now. I mean, that's cool, man. Look at all those. I did, I, you know, it's like, I just want to get in there and live in there. And, and the, another thing I noticed, there are a couple angles off in perspective because um, I copied and pasted the structure behind it. And so I noticed a couple things are a little bit off, but again, that's not the purpose of this. This is my brainstorm session and I have a little bit of a tangency there, but that's all right. Um, this is brainstorm session. This is to come up with another idea and another variant to show my client. That's it. And what I decided to do is see that how I flap, turn that on and off because I thought it'd be a good idea to put that thick a building behind the so the one building has supports on it then the building behind it goes all the way to the ground that way if i had too many support legs it'd be too busy this way it might look like it anchors itself a little bit and then there's another structure sort of built into it so that's cool i like that okay so i'm sorry i didn't really show the one on the bottom left here but all i did on that one was copy and paste um the one building in front of the other building. And I think that worked pretty well. See that one? And then there, I just copied and pasted it and made it larger, and then it made it look like it's attached. So, and then here I have, I added that little middle segment there to attach these two together to give it a different shape. Okay? So that's pretty cool. And then what I did here is I came in and I added in some blue, put my little logo on it, let me zoom in there and I'll show it to you. The blue pops it forward. So this is how I, I would present my rough idea. And then after this, I would take it and punch it up forward, you know? So I think that works. 